Let me just turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. The title of the sermon to, uh, this morning is, Ye are the temple. Ye are the temple of the living God. Now, super, supernaturally, it's hard to understand, yet somehow God has his presence in you, in your body, okay, in your spirit, in that new man. Remember when we, we read about, uh, we were looking at the, the sermon of new life, and we said how the seed of God remaineth in someone that's saved. Okay, and so there is a part of you that is actually God himself. Somehow, it's not you, but it's, a, it's, it's God that it's in you, and he is able to use you even in these corrupted bodies that we have, and he calls us his temple. Okay, so I mean, that is, that, that is a sobering thought. You know, that God will dwell in us, knowing full well how sinful, how corrupted we are. Not just physically, but mentally, in our hearts, our wicked hearts, yet God sees fit to dwell in us. Let's pick it up from verse number one. Ye are the temple, verse number one. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. So, picking up from, from chapter number five, we were left with the thought that we are ambassadors of God. We've been left with the, the ministry of reconciliation that he's left us to do. He's left us work to do for him, okay? But not only do we work for him, the, verse number one says we work together with him. Okay, so as we go about our lives seeking to serve him, whether that's in our church or toward one another, whether that's preaching the gospel or just our daily walk in faith, he says he's working together with us. Okay, how? Because again, pick up this idea that we are this temple and that he is indwelling in us. Okay, the Holy Ghost is in us and through his power, through his might, through his strength, he is able to work with us. You are not alone in your service to God. He's going to empower you to be able to serve him to your full potential. Not to boast in your strength, not to boast in your flesh, but to boast in the living God. Okay? Now the next verses, I feel, I might have a different interpretation to this than what you may have when you've read this in the past. Because when I, usually when I hear preaching on the following verses, it's the idea of salvation in the sense that perhaps people in the Corinthian church were unsaved and they needed to get saved. Okay, because look at verse number one. He says, I beseech you, I beseech you, meaning that I'm persuading you, I'm begging of you, also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So had they received the grace of God, had they received salvation in vain? Were they not believing properly? Were they not saved? And so the warning is coming from the apostle, hey, you need to make sure that you've not received that grace in vain, that you're not saved. Because when you look at verse number two, we won't go to that fully yet, but it says today is the day of salvation. So a lot of preachers take these passages to mean that there are certain individuals in this church that needed to get saved and that Paul was compelling them to get saved. Now, I think you can use that as a secondary application to these verses, but I don't think that fits the context of what we've been reading. Okay, because Paul is saying to them, hey, you're a worker. You can only be a worker for the Lord. You can only be working with him if you are already saved. So how can we then take the grace of God in vain if we're already saved? Think about that. He just says we're workers together with him. So if we're not doing the work, we are taking the grace of God in vain. Okay, we're, we're being empty. We're not being profitable with what we have. We have the words of eternal life. We have the truth on our side. We have the gospel. We have the free gift to give to, liberally to all men. Okay? Every creature needs to hear the gospel. But if we're not making a conscious effort to get the gospel out, then we are taking the grace of God in vain. Okay? Jesus Christ said in Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Okay? So if we're a worker with Jesus Christ, we're a worker with God, we know we're working with God who has all power in heaven and in earth. Now we should be able to be successful in our efforts to get the gospel out, right? And look, please don't judge success on the number of souls saved. If you're out there knocking doors, 
Even if you spend two hours knocking doors with no, no one answering, hey, that is successful soul winning. You're doing the work with him. It's a time of fellowship, maybe with your silent partner. It's a time of fellowship with Jesus Christ himself. Okay? We're embarked on a godly spiritual mission and we have all the power that Jesus Christ has at his disposal in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I love the next words, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way. I am with you all the way, Jesus Christ says. Okay? You're never alone when you're saved. You're never alone when you're working, working for God. Even if you don't have a silent partner to go with, you only have yourself to knock those doors. Jesus Christ says, I am with you all the way. I'm with you all the way that you go. <coughs> Even unto the end of the world. Amen. Okay, so look, our, our job is to take the grace of God, which is the gospel. I'll just quickly read to you from Acts 20. Actually, maybe turn there. Keep a finger in 2 Corinthians 6, just to reinforce this point to you. Uh, Acts, Acts 20, 24. Acts 20, 24. Acts 20, 24. It says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, look at the next words, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, so you see him, he's testifying the gospel of the grace of God. And if we're not testifying that gospel of the grace of God, then we're taking the grace of God in vain. Okay, so I just wanted to reinforce that with those passages that this is not about, he's not beseeching them to get saved. He's beseeching the church to do the work and go soul winning. Okay? And you might say, boy, Kevin, man, I, I didn't think I'd get into a church that's harping on soul winning just about every week. You know? I remember Callum said to me, you know, because he preached once on soul winning, he says, oh, you know, maybe I should leave that to you to preach on soul winning. Hey, every, every sermon's on soul winning. You know, every, because that's the main work that God has left us to do. It's the first works. It's a primary work that he's left us to do. It's a primary command. Of course, the primary command is to love the Lord with all our heart. But hey, what greater way to love the Lord than to take that message of his sacrifice of his son and give that to, to this community? How many churches? Like, look, we're going chapter by chapter. It's not like I'm picking out chapters about soul winning. I mean, you, you just read the Bible and it's always about preaching the gospel. It's always about winning souls. And it's a sad thing when you're in a church and that's like the lowest priority. You know, you want to be in a church, even if you're not doing the soul winning, you're just kind of convicted. Like, man, I should get out there. You know, every opportunity that I get, I should be able to preach the gospel. Oh, Kevin's preaching on that again. You know, yeah, I wanted to disturb you if you're not doing the soul winning, right? And it's not that I'm doing it on purpose. It's just that's what the Bible teaches us. Chapter by chapter. That's the key thing that we need to do, right? And that's why it's one of the main goals for New Life Baptist Church. So let's look at verse number two now. Verse number two. Keeping in mind that this is about a saved church to do the works, okay? It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And again, I've had a lot of preaching. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not being critical of the preaching. Because again, I think it is a, it is a, a uh, proper application. Okay? Quite often they'll preach this and say, hey, if you're not saved, you need to get saved today because today is a day of salvation. And it's seen from the perspective of the lost sinner. But again, no, this is of the perspective of a saved church member. Okay? He's beseeching them, he's saying, look, today is a day of salvation. Every day is a day that you can get out there and preach the gospel and see souls saved. It's to encourage the church today. Look, it's not next week. It's not that soul winning time on a weekly basis. Well, it is that as well. But it's every day. It should be part of our life when we get alone with someone that's unsaved. We get the opportunity. We should take advantage of that day because today is a day of salvation. Every day is a day of salvation. And that ought to drive us to get out there and preach the gospel. Okay? Now, it says here, For he saith... And again, I like to go back. Where is it said? Where is it written? 
So if you can, turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 49. So let's have a look at where it's written. Isaiah 49, verse 7. Isaiah 49, verse 7. Because I want to piggyback a little bit on Matthew's sermon on Friday. In fact, I'm going to piggyback on it quite a bit in this chapter. Isaiah 49, verse 7. It was, it was that good that I, you know, now, it was just the timing. The timing worked out really well. Isaiah 49, verse 7. So, these words that we read in verse number 2, they're written to who? The Corinthian church. It's written to Greek believers. It's written to Gentiles, right? Let's look at Isaiah 49, verse 7. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of who? Of Israel. And people will stop you now and say, well, we know that Isaiah was writing here to Israel of old, to the Jews of old. You know, these, these are for the Jews of old. You know, the church is not Israel. Don't you understand that, Kevin? Are you that blind that you don't understand this dispensational separation between Israel and the church? Well, let's have a look at this. Isaiah 49 verse 7, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, I believe that's a reference to Jesus Christ, to, whom, uh, it, to Him whom man despiseth, to, whom, uh, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to the servants of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, as he shall choose thee. Choose who? Israel, right? Verse number 8. This is, in, this is what's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause the inherit, to inherit the desolate heritages. So here we're talking about uh, what I believe to be the millennial reign of Christ, a future promise spoken in the Old Testament to Old Testament Israel, and saying, hey, this is a promise to come even in the millennium. Okay, that he's going to, it's the day of salvation, even into the millennium for Israel. Verse number 9, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. So the Israel of God, the Israel of God is the one who has received his salvation. In the New Testament, you are the Israel of God. Okay, don't take my word for it. Take Paul's word for it. He gets it from Isaiah, referring to Israel. But he applies it in the New Testament to who? To the New Testament Gentile church in Corinth. They're not Jews. Well, maybe some of them were Jews, but most of them were Greeks. Okay? So you can't just say, Isaiah, that's just applied to the Jews. We have the light of the New Testament, which reinforces the fact that this was written to us as well. Why? Because there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There's one people of God. There's one flock that belongs to Jesus Christ. It's made up of all nations. It's made up of Jews and of Greeks and of Gentiles. It's made up of Romans. It's made up of the Corinthians. It's made up of the Chileans and the Portuguese and the, and the New Zealanders and the... Uh, I don't know, is that it? Is that what I have I covered? The Australians, sorry, of course, Australians. It's, it's, it's for everybody, okay? If you're received of Christ, you've received his salvation, you are the Israel of God. God is truly not a respecter of persons. Verse number 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. <coughs> Can I ask someone for a cup of water? So anyone, if you can get me one, that'd be great. Giving no offense, thanks, Callum. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Now, this teaching also was taught to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. I'll just read it to you very quickly. 1 Corinthians 10 32. He said, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my, mine own but the prophet of many. So why does he not want to give offense to the Jews, to the Gentiles, 
nor to the church of God, he says, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Okay, that they may be saved. We need to be mindful as we go about doing God's work that we don't intentionally go out trying to offend people. Okay, and I know people that do this. I know Christians that intentionally go out to offend. Now, I, first of all, I praise God that the gospel is getting out anyway. Okay, we see even Paul praising people that are going about doing it in the, in, in the wrong, uh, with the wrong purpose. Okay, we ought to be praising the fact that the gospel is getting out. Okay, but if we want to be like, uh, if we want to be right, if we want to be as, as, as true as we can to the word of God, we need to make sure that we do it without offense. Now, the word of God is going to offend people anyway. You know that. When you start telling people, hey, your good works aren't enough to get you to heaven, you know that offends them a little bit. When you tell them that one man, Jesus Christ, died for all their sins, you know that offends them. They don't think they need somebody to die for them. They don't think they need a saviour. Hey, the word of God alone offends people. Even just salvation can offend people. Okay, the gospel, let alone the rest of the Bible, I mean, that's just going to keep offending you if you've read it from cover to cover, Right? But you yourselves shouldn't be going out there being overly aggressive, being overly rude, okay? Because you don't know. That person may reject you now, but by your behavior, they may be more receptive in future when they hear the gospel again. But by your bad behavior, they might completely, uh, as it says here, they might completely blame the ministry by your lack of, of uh, you know, care for that person. You go out and offend them, Next time they hear, you know, they think of the ministry, they think of the gospel, they think of the Bible, they're offended and uh, they blame the ministry. They blame Christianity. They blame God instead of just blaming that stupid person that uh, was rude on purpose, that was offensive. So be mindful with the way you go about doing the work, the ministry of reconciliation. People can reject the gospel because of your behavior. Wow, think about that. Because of your behavior. Now, ultimately, they go to hell because they reject Jesus Christ. Okay? But you don't want to be a contributing factor to their rejection. Okay? Now, let's look at verse number four. <clears throat> and what I like about the next verses, verses four to ten, you know how we have qualifications of the bishop and qualifications of the deacon? Well, this is to me kind of like the qualifications you need to have as a soul winner. Now, you don't need to have all these qualifications to go soul winning. But this is definitely something we need to be working toward. Okay, Paul sets this example of how he is as a soul winner, not giving offense to people. In what way? Verse number four. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. How does he approve of himself? See, he's talking about, hey, I'm proving that I'm a minister of God, that I'm a minister of the gospel of the grace of God. How do I do that? He says, in much patience. Amen. Patience. You told me you don't have patience. <laughs> you don't work on that, brother. <laughs> we all look, we go through this list, we're going to find things that we need to work on, okay, to be more effective soul winners. In much patience. Look, patience with people. Be patient with people at the door. I have spent an hour with people just to get them saved. I remember just speaking to someone that was obviously mentally handicapped and I had to get, go through things over and over and over again. I thought I was wasting my time. I thought maybe I should just move on. But that, that was just me lacking patience. Eventually she got it. Eventually she understood and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, called upon the name of the Lord. But if I didn't have the patience, I might have walked out after 20 minutes. I think it was an, I think it was an hour and a half that I spent with this individual. Okay. There are times you need to spend that time with that one person. Don't think a 10, 15 minute presentation is going to work for everybody. Be patient. Let people have a lot of questions. They might not fully understand. You know, don't rush to the next point. Make sure they've understood the previous point before you moved on. But be patient not just with people. Be patient with, your, with the ministry. You know, because again, sometimes you're just not going to have those days that you feel were profitable. But it's always profitable because Jesus Christ is with you. It's his work. He's going to reward you for the work you've done for him. Okay, it's always profitable. Think about that. And that will give you the patience to continue knocking those doors. You know, knocking house number 98, house number 99, house number 100. Finally, maybe 100, you'll get to preach the gospel and see someone saved. So please be patient even in the ministry. In afflictions, 
So continue doing his work even when you're troubled. In necessities, it says there in verse 4. So even when you're in need, even in times of need, he says, hey, I'm still a minister of God. I'm still serving him. Even when I have personal needs. But he was able to see the need of the unsaved. He was able to see their need of salvation. He was able to see that their soul would be in hell should he not do the work of God and see people saved. He had the needs of others in mind before his own personal necessities. It says in distresses, perseverance in difficulties. You know, things are going to get more difficult. You know, we live in a great country. I've said this before. You know, we have the freedom to preach the gospel. But there's going to be times when it's going to get more difficult. Okay, there might be laws put in place where we can't knock doors and preach the gospel. I don't know. But even in distresses, even in times of difficulties, we persevere. We preach in the gospel. Verse number five, in stripes. That's whipped. Paul was whipped. I don't know if you've been whipped for preaching the gospel. I have. I haven't. <laughs> Sorry. I haven't. I don't think you have. Even then he continued. Even after physical attack, it didn't stop him. In imprisonments. You know, and I think of Pastor Logan Robertson now, you know, in, in, in detention. You know, and, and I spoke to him Saturday morning. And I asked him, so are you getting a chance to preach the gospel? He goes, yeah. You know, but so far, because he's in high security, he's with the worst, maybe he's with reprobates, I don't know. Maybe that's the people that he's with. Hey, but even in detention, he's out there preaching the gospel. Even in jail, even in imprisonment. Okay, now you might have your own thoughts as to, hey, you know, he, you know, he deserves to be there or whatever. Hey, but at least he's getting the gospel out, okay? At least he's using the opportunity that he's got to get the gospel out. And I have great respect for men who are imprisoned in this nation or in other nations who, who believe in Jesus Christ and are still preaching the word of God. I have great respect for that. I've told you a story about one of my previous pastors who had a stroke and then he lost his memory. He couldn't remember his wife. He was, like in his, he, was, he was old, like in his 80s. He couldn't remember his wife. He couldn't remember his children. He couldn't remember anything about his like, life in his last, last few months. All he remembered was the gospel. All he remembered was he's got to preach the gospel in the nursing home that he was in. Okay, he's not imprisoned, if you will, in a jail. But in a sense, you are kind of imprisoned when you're in a nursing home and you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have your mind there anymore. But even then, somehow, the new man, that spirit knew, we need to get the gospel out to the people here. I have great respect for people like that. And then us who have the freedom, think about that. Us who have the freedom and don't do it, it's a shame. It's a shame. Verse number five, in, in tumults, tumult, how do you pronounce that? Tumults? Tumult? It's like rioting. Okay, so obviously if you know some stories, you know, there were many Jews that rised up against Paul and, and many of the New Testament believers and persecuted them, you know, got the community to persecute them um, or just, just generally people that believed in a, in a false god. In labors, so even when they were tired, they continued, they continued on. In watchings, you know, usually when you watch, you watch during the night, okay? And what he's saying there is he's got a lack of sleep. He hasn't been sleeping well. And even then he's preaching the gospel. In fastings. It's not like he's fasting like a spiritual fast and he's purposely fasting. No, he's going without food. Okay, he's going without sleep. He's going without food. And yet, this approves that he's a minister of God because he's still concerned about getting the gospel out. It's a great man. This is someone that we ought to look at, look, look up to, okay, and say, hey, are we like this as soul winners? You know, there's a lot of this list that we can improve on, you know, or encourage us to get out there and do more for the Lord. Me personally as well, you know. Verse number six. Verse number six. In pureness. He does it out of a pure heart. A genuine desire to see people saved. Okay? By knowledge. Hey, learn. Prepare. Learn your verses. You know, be ready to answer questions that come your way. You know, have knowledge. Don't, don't go in, you know, preaching the gospel, not knowing what you're saying, not knowing how to respond, not knowing wh where to turn to. You know, he prepared, he had the knowledge to be able to be effective in his soul winning by long suffering. Long suffering is a very similar to word to patience, but it's more about um, 
your own, like it's, it's more like calmness, being calm. Than, and it's very similar to being patient, okay? But it's, 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 it's uh, you know, assessing the situation with calmness, not reacting uh, too, too rashly or too quickly. By kindness, you know, he was kind toward people. Again, he wasn't out there trying to offend people, okay? He was trying to be kind toward people. By the Holy Ghost, he had the power of God on his side. He was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. This is why he's able to persevere, because honestly, if we're, if we're not walking in the Spirit, and we're being imprisoned, and we're being whipped, and we're, we're going without food, and we're going without sleep, I think I would personally give up. But if I have the power of the Holy Ghost on my side, if I'm filled with Him, and I have Him in my mind, and I have His job in mind, the work that He's left us to do, obviously that's going to drive us to do the great works that, you know, that Paul was able to do. By love unfeigned, verse number 6. It's true love. A true love for non-believers. A true love for the lost of this world. Do you have true love for the unsaved? It's not easy to love the unsaved. <laughs> but Paul was able to have that true love, you know, unfeigned love. And again, let me encourage you, if you don't have that love, all it takes is for you to get out there and knock the doors. Because then you'll realise how lost this world truly is. And you'll notice, hey, these are nice people. Hey, these are people that are searching. These are people that are confused. These are people that were offended by the Roman Catholic Church or offended by some religion and they reject it all because of what some man has done. And then when you understand that they go into eternity to, in hell, it's going to bring sadness. It's going to bring great love for these people. Okay? Go in soul winning will increase your love for the non-believing world. Verse number seven. And I love, this is important. By the word of truth. Was he preaching the gospel by his own intelligence, by his own wisdom? No, he took the word of truth. He took the scriptures, okay? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to be ineffective if you're not using the scriptures. <coughs> I've seen many gospel tracts with no verses whatsoever. Gospel tracts with, with maybe one verse. You need, you, need, you need God's word to preach the gospel, guys. Don't think you can do it in your own power. Look what it says next. By the power of God. What's the power of God? Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What's the power of God in, in the gospel? Uh, salvation, it's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not your fancy analogy that's going to get people saved. It's not your fancy story, your fancy way to explain salvation. Now, it's good to use analogies to help illustrate some points, but it's the power of God, it's the gospel, it's the word of God that will get them saved. He says, by the armor, in verse number 7, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. I don't really understand that phrase. Again, if you guys have some thoughts, let me know. But I'm thinking about the armor of God, right? And if you remember the armor of God, it talks about the shield of faith. So usually when you're fighting a battle, one hand's holding the shield of faith. One hand's holding the shield. The other hand's got the sword of the spirit. So I, potentially this is what's being referred to, that we go out with that word of God, the spirit of God, but also with the shield of faith to protect us from the evil one. So he's going out there, fighting a battle, attacking, but also defending. Okay? That's what I think that's referring to. Let me know if you've got some thoughts. Verse number eight. By honor and dishonor. You know, sometimes being a minister of God brings you honor. Sometimes people respect that, especially amongst other believers. Well, not always, but usually amongst other believers. But quite often being a minister of God will also bring dishonor. People will speak, speak badly of you. Okay? We'll look down on you. It doesn't matter. He wasn't driven by the opinions of others, whether it was positive or negative. It doesn't matter what others thought of him. You know, we need to be people that are not so offended, not so easily offended. People tell me, oh, Kevin, such and such thinks this about you. Who cares? All right? Who cares? I mean, hey, maybe, maybe they've got a legitimate 
thing that, that I need to change about myself. But if it's just the Word of God, if it's just preaching the Word of God as it, it is, then who cares? I'm here to please God and not man. By evil report and good report, it's kind of the same idea. People speaking evil of him or speaking good of him, it doesn't matter. As deceivers and yet true. So people perceived him as a deceiver, telling falsehoods, telling lies. He goes, and yet true. He knows he's true. He knows he's preaching the true word of God. That's what motivates us, guys. It doesn't matter what others are saying about you. They'll say you're a deceiver. They'll do worse than that to you. But we got the truth of the word of God. We know we're serving him. And that's, that's what we need to be mindful of, that we're, we're of the truth. We're people of the truth. Verse number nine. As unknown and yet well known. Hold your finger there and turn to Acts 19. Acts 19. As unknown and yet well known. Now, as believers, as God's people, we're not celebrities of this world. We're not known of this world. Okay, if you want to be a celebrity, you want to be well known, serving God's not going to get you there. If you want to be known by the world, that is, okay? But look at Acts 19, verse 13. Acts 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one uh, Sceva, Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Hey, if you're a child of God, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, as you go out and fight this spiritual battle for the souls of men, guess who's going to know you? The devil's going to know you. The evil spirits are going to know you. They know Jesus. They know Paul. And they know the people of God. The world may not know you, but the forces of evil know who you are. Okay? And that's why you need to be ready with this armor to fight the battle. It's going to come. The devil's going to attack you because you have the words of eternal life and you're shaking his kingdom. But of course you're also known of God. You're known of God. Okay, so you are well known, brothers and sisters, in the spiritual realm, realm, both by the enemy and by God and his angels, but you're not going to be known by this world. Okay, you're not going to be known by this world. That's the, that's the reality of the soul winner. That's the reality of someone that serves the Lord. As di sorry, 2 Corinthians, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. As dying and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed. I won't say to spend too much time on that, but obviously suffering to the point of death. But he says, I live because he has eternal life. He knows if he dies, he's, got, he's going to be with the Lord forever. Uh, chastened and not killed. You know, again, just, just the personal attacks that's come upon him. But he's not going to be killed. He's not going to die. Even if you die physically, you know you're not dead. Okay? You're more alive than ever when this physical body dies. You're more alive than ever. You're with the Lord. Verse number 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. You know, life is going to bring the sorrows upon you. There's going to be times you're sad and depressed. But if you've got the Lord, if you're drawing strength from the Lord, you can still rejoice when you're suffering. As poor, yet making many rich. He saw himself as poor. He didn't have a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, possessions. But he was making others rich. Right? He was, he was giving them those homes in heaven, those mansions on high, those streets of gold to walk in, and the rewards of, of heaven should they serve the Lord as having nothing and yet possessing all things. He, he had nothing of this world, but he possessed all the things, the kingdom of God, was at his disposal. Lay up your treasures in heaven, guys. Don't have the mindset just on this temporary world. Now, verse 11 changes direction a little bit now. Let's look at this. Verse 11 and 12. O ye Corinthians, 
Our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Okay, so, let's look at this. He says, our mouth is open to you. So he's speaking words of encouragement to the Corinthians. Okay, and then he says, our heart is enlarged. He's saying, look, I've got great love for you. Okay, Corinthian church, I'm, I'm, I want to encourage you. I want to build you up. I want you to know that I love you so much. Okay? Then verse 12, he says, Ye are not straightened in us. Think about that. What does it mean to the word straight? You know, S-T-R-A-I-T. It means narrow, doesn't it? Okay? It means narrow. So he says, Ye are not straightened in us. He's saying, Hey, I'm not trying to constrain you. I'm not trying to restrict you. I'm not trying to put pressure upon you. Okay? But you're straightened by your own bowels. He's saying kind of like you're, you're being convicted by your own conscience because you're not serving the Lord the way that you ought to. Okay? It's not coming from me. I'm just trying to encourage you in the Lord. Okay? And then look at verse 13. Verse 13. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Okay, this is the love that Paul had for this church. He saw them as his children. That's because they literally were his spiritual children. He had seen many of these people saved. He has great love for them. He's reinforcing that to them. But then it says in verse 13, Now for a recompense in the same. I want you in the same way to love me. I want you in the same way to love the workers of God. It says here, Be ye also enlarged. So it says here, it tells me that the Corinthians were, were, were not loving Paul the way they ought to. They weren't uh, returning that love. Their heart wasn't opened in the same way that Paul's heart was open to them. Again, we see in 1 Corinthians that some were critical of Paul. Okay? Now you might be asking, well, why? Why is Paul saying these words? You know, you need to love us. You need to love the workers of God. You know, you need to serve the Lord. Be encouraged. I think the next verses kind of makes it clear. Because then he says in verse four, uh, 13, 14, sorry, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So this church in Corinth was yoked together with the world. They were yoked together with the unbelievers. They were fellowshipping with the unbelievers. They were praising this world. But they didn't have the love for the people of God. They didn't have the love for Paul and those that were sacrificing their lives for the name of Christ. They had a double standard. That's what I think is going on here. He's saying, hey, love God's people. You know, you, you can't just, you know, and this is what happens in, in churches. Someone gets offended by another believer. Oh, Christians. And it's something small. And what do they do? They go into the world. They make friends of the world. They associate with the world and they get out of church. Those people are worse. Those people are going to do worse to you. They're going to cause you to sin. They're going to cause you to walk away from the Lord. All because one believer, some in church, offended you with one little thing. That happens all the time. And I think this is what the situation is in, in the Corinth church. They had these double standards. Oh, Paul, you know, he's a bit rough, right? You know, he, he, he's making us look bad because he's getting imprisoned and all this stuff. But oh, oh, we make friends with all the unbelievers and it doesn't matter how wicked and evil they are, you know, we're not going to hold them to that. Look, we need to make sure that we love God's people, that we love the believers. That's our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, as family, physical family, we share the same blood. You know, and as, as believers, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we share the same blood of Jesus Christ. How much more precious is that blood that saves us from our sins? We have to love our brethren, you know? And look, not everyone's easy to get along with. I'm not, I know I'm not the easiest person to get along with. I know I can say something to offend you sometimes or whatever. I'm sorry if I do that, you know? But we all have faults. We're all, we're all just trying the best. We're all trying to mature and grow. And unfortunately, we still all have the flesh, okay? We all still fail. But we need to love our brethren. You know, even when we think they've done something wrong. Even if we think they're deserving of detention. 
You know what I'm talking about. I still love my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Okay? I'm not going to turn and join forces with, a, with the media or join forces with false religion and accuse the brethren. Okay? I'm not going to accuse my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I ought to love them and not yoke up with the media, not to yoke up with false religion of Islam or, or yoke up with the, uh, the homosexuals against Christianity. That's not going to happen. We need to have that mindset, hey guys, we're not perfect. We're not all perfect. But we still ought to have a love and an encouragement for our brethren. Look at Paul. We saw how messed up this church was. He still loved them. He wanted to encourage them. Even if I have to break fellowship with people, separate myself from brethren, I still love them. I still want them to repent. I still want them to get, the, you know, to get things straight. You know, but I still love them. I want them to serve the Lord. We need to be mindful about these things, guys. You know, sometimes we're just extra harsh on believers. And yet we forget, hey, every believer still has the flesh. Every believer is still trying to be more like Christ. Some of us start at a really bad stage in life and we need more work to get to a point where we're mature as believers. Just be mindful of these things. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? So don't be yoked together with this unbelieving world. Look, there are some things that you can't help. You need to work. You know, I know you've got some reprobates that you need to work with. You know, God's asked us to work and provide for our family. So there's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes you're going to be with the worst of them out there. Just do the work. Have a mind that you're serving the Lord. Okay? And just get the job done and provide for your family. Okay? But then don't take those same people that are wicked and go out and, and have a drink with them at the bar. You know, don't go out and make them your best friends. Okay? Be friendly toward them. Don't try to offend them because you may get the opportunity to preach the gospel. But try to make friends with God's people. Okay, this is why I encourage not just to come to church, but try to hang around for the fellowship. You know, get to know one another, care for one another, share your burdens toward one another so we can be prayerful and mindful of one another. Verse number 15. And what concord have Christ with Belial? That's another name for the devil. That's pretty harsh. I mean, think about the devil and Jesus Christ. Just polar opposites, right? One full of righteousness, who cannot sin, who has never sinned, and the devil who's the father of lies. You know, full of corruption, full of pride. And it's using that comparison of ourselves as believers with the unbelieving world. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that everybody that's unsaved is a child of the devil or something like this, okay? But it's just, it's just comparing the facts that the new man that's it within us is perfect and pure and righteous, a child of God. So why should we be together with people that are, uh, uh, that are wicked, that are sinful, that are going to influence us in this world? For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? I already read that, sorry, verse 15. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Do you guys know what an infidel is? It's just a non-believer. Just a, a non-believer. So what part hath he that believeth with an unbeliever, an infidel? I mean, again, these are comments that I've heard from Christians. I can't get along with Christians, but I can get along with my buddies, you know, my drinking buddies and my... My drug, my drug, dr druggies, buddies that I've got, my old friends that are worldly, I can get along with them just fine, but I just can't seem to get along with Christians. Now, I think there are many Christians that are prideful and they are hard to get along with. Okay, I don't want a church to be, our church to be like this at all, you know. But if you find that you as a believer can get along, can get along better with the unbelievers, there's a problem. There's a problem. Why can you associate yourself so closely with them? It's because you're serving, them, you're, you're, you're fellowshipping with them in the flesh. It's not a hard thing to be associated with the unbelieving, wicked world because we all have that flesh, okay? But keep in mind that as you sow to that flesh, 
As you, as you sow corruption, it's going to influence your life. It's going to hurt your spiritual life. It's going to hurt your family. It's going to hurt your church. We need to make sure that our friends, the people that we associate with, are like-minded believers. And maybe not completely like-minded, but at least saved believers. At least trying to understand the Word of God and trying to walk in, in His path that He's left us to do. Sorry guys, I'm struggling a little bit. Verse 16. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What's the temple of God? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I'll just quickly read to you from 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. You are his temple. Your body is his temple. This is why you ought not to be fellowshipping and yoking yourself up with the wicked world. Because you are the temple of God. You're going to take God's temple and put it into the world and let it be defiled by the world? No. You need to try to maintain a clean, holy life. Please turn to the book of Leviticus. Keep your finger there in 2 Corinthians. Turn to Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. Now, as we read these final verses in 2 Corinthians, I just want you to keep in mind the distinction, and I spoke about this briefly yet, uh, last, last Sunday, the distinction between our position with God and our walk with God. Okay, Remember, those two things are different. Okay, Because if you, you need to keep that in mind for the next verses. Um, but Le Leviticus 26 verse 12. Look at these words. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. This was spoken in the Old Testament. This has been quoted again to the Gentile church, these Greeks. But who is he talking to in the book of Leviticus? Look at verse 13. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. So we see that God, when he, when he took Israel out of Egypt, these words are to Israel. And these are the same words that he speaks to us today. Again, we are the Israel of God. Okay, keep that in mind. But notice there, in verse 13, he says that he broke the bands of your yoke. They were yoked up with the Egyptians. They were yoked up with the unbelieving world. And so, you know, Paul sees fit to use this in the New Testament. In the same way, when our best friends, when our partnerships, when our fellowship is with this lost uh, world in this wicked world, it's like being in bondage with Egypt. Okay, that's the picture that we get of the Old Testament. Um, keep your finger there. Actually, no. You can turn from Levit Leviticus. Go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. I want to show you all the places God said the same thing. Okay? Ezekiel 37. So it's said in the New Testament for the church, the New Testament church. It's said in the Old Testament for Old Testament Israel that were delivered out of bondage, out of Egypt. And look at Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 verse 27. Ezekiel 37 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify who? Israel. When my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. This is the millennial reign of Christ. You know, when the heathen can look and see God ruling and reigning in this world, and to the, to, to the world who say, look, these are my people. The saved, the Israel of God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The point I want to bring to you here is that we saw these, these words in the New Testament for us. We see them in the Old Testament for Israel, Old Testament Israel. And then we see the same words for the future millennium. Everyone that believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that receives salvation by grace through faith, 
has the God of Israel and you are the people of God. Again, we're one fold, one people, one nation of God. Okay, we're all Israelites, not by the flesh necessarily, but through the spirit, through the circumcision of the heart, which is why it's so, that sermon was so effective on Friday. goes well with what we're seeing today. These words were for Old Testament Israel. Keep that in mind, guys. It's not two separate groups. We're one. Okay? There's no enmity between us. There's no separation. There's no division between the people of God. We all belong to Him. He is our God, and we are His people. Go back to 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. Now, when we looked at verse 16, we, we saw that we are the temple of God. We become the temple of God when you believe on Jesus Christ, okay? You're saved, you're born again. The Holy Ghost comes and indwells in you. You are now positionally saved. You are positionally His people. That's not going to change. But then verses 17 and 18 is not your position anymore. It's your walk with the Lord, Okay? So because our position before God is the way it is, because we are his temple, because he indwells in us, because we're his people, we look at verse 17. Wherefore, so because of this, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Is this salvation? Again, people would take these verses and apply it to salvation. See, you've got to clean up your life. You've got to turn from your sins. You've got to stop work, walking with the world to be saved. No! This is a requirement. This is a command of God because we're already the temple of God. Because we're already saved. And because we're saved, we need to try to improve our lives. You know? We need to try to overcome the sin. We need to try to uh, move away from people that are influencing us in a negative way. We need to not be worldly. We need to have our sights set on eternity, on the kingdom of God, seeking to serve Him. And I will receive you. This is our fellowship with the Lord. Okay, you can be a Christian, just have a broken fellowship with God for the rest of your life. You'll still be saved, but you just won't be able to enjoy the blessings of God's presence in your life, the power of God in your life. But if you do separate yourself from the world, if you do clean up your life, if you do strive to be more holy, look at verse 18, and I will be a father unto you. Okay, it's not, he's already our father because we're born of God, but the, real, the, the fellowship with the father, okay? I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So a father-son or a father-daughter fellowship can be had if we walk in his paths, if we walk after his way, if we walk in his commandments and his laws, and we seek to have a close fellowship with the Lord. That's what we want to strive to do, guys. You know, we harp on about salvation, being without works. Amen! We harp on about salvation, being a free gift. Amen! But we can't just leave it there. Once we're saved, we need to say, hey, we need to preach against sin. We need to preach against worldliness. We need to preach against false religion. We need to preach, you know, to keep ourselves pure and clean as much as we possibly can pleasing to the Lord. That's important not for salvation but because we're that temple of God we need to sanctify that temple of God keep it clean, keep it pure keep it holy don't stop there, I'm saved thank God I can continue living how I want no, God wants more than that God wants you to clean up your life and have that close fellowship with Him uh, let's pray